everyone to this very depressing uh, again uh, this is a new SBA Brisbane node symbio meeting so these events are sponsored by the SBA Symbiotic Biology Australasia the Code Science Swiss New England Biolabs and recently the, the UQ node of the ARC Center for Synthetic Biology So before we start, SBA Brisbane acknowledge the Turbul and Bigera people as the traditional owners of the land of which this event is taking place, and we pay our respects to their elder, past, present, and emerging. We recognize that this land has always been a place of teaching, research, and learning. SBA has a vision and purpose, so we have already shared that before with you guys. We just want to say that one and why are we doing this here? So we envisage a highly innovative in bio industry in Brisbane and wider Brisbane area, which combines research of excellence in local universities in the vast natural resources in the region to create the next generation of world leading bio industries. Our purpose as a local node of the SBA is the development of a Brisbane based symbio network between uh, our universities startups, uh, students, and at some point, general public, uh, to promote collaboration and discussions on links between research, industry, and the public, foster scientific excellence to target skills development, and promote some bio-concept and discuss them with the public. So we're going to start this seminar uh, with Dr. Christy Short. Dr. Christy Short is from UQ. Head of the Department of Biology at UQ, and she obtained her PhD from the University of Melbourne. And uh, probably most of you have known her as a UQ expert in the area of influenza, and more uh, regularly right now that with all the COVID uh, pandemic. So please uh, welcome Dr. Christy Short. Thank you. Sorry, uh, my it's been a pretty busy year and a bit being uh, a virologist uh, and working in emerging respiratory viruses. So I could have talked to you today about COVID, um, but to be honest, I've done a lot of talks about COVID and I'm still equally passionate about flu. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about flu, but I think a lot of um, the insights we'll see in terms of um, zoonoses and viruses spreading from one species to another apply equally to flu as they do to COVID. So today I want to talk to you about our work uh, in particular in avian influenza and what we've done trying to use comparative genomics to kind of unravel what's going on. So for those of you who are not aware, all flu strains come from birds. If you want to blame somebody for, for flu, blame birds. So this is predominantly sort of waterfowl and in these species, influenza really doesn't cause much bit illness. It's very, very mild. But what can happen is the virus can spread from these waterfowl into poultry. And this is where we start to run into problems. So the virus originally in poultry doesn't cause severe disease. It's referred to as low pathogenic avian influenza. And probably you'd only detect it in your poultry um, by things like a drop in layer production, maybe a drop in size, very minor signs. But what can happen in poultry is that two subtypes of influenza virus, H5 and H7, can actually mutate. And this mutation only happens in poultry. We have no idea why it only happens in poultry, but it only happens in poultry. And they mutate from being this low pathogenic avian influenza virus to this high pathogenic avian influenza virus. And I'll show you what that means for chickens in a minute. But what can then happen is once these high pathogenic avian influenza viruses emerge, they can spread to mammalian species like us, but they can also spill back over into the original uh, sources of this virus, so back over into the waterfowl. So, um, as I mentioned to you, low pathogenic avian influenza in chickens causes very, very mild disease. And the virus predominantly infects cells in epithelial cells in the airway and in the intestine. But you can have this mutation process happen where you get this highly pathogenic avian influenza virus emerging. And unfortunately, that's what's happening to the, I don't know if that works. Whoa, okay, I got too excited. I'll use the mouse. Um, that's what's happened to the chickens on the right here. So chickens will die from this within two to three days of developing symptoms. They typically have edema, they have hemorrhaging. Um, you can see here the hemorrhaging in the legs. 
and these uh, symptoms, these very, very severe symptoms, are derived from the fact that the virus targets cells in the endothelium. So it targets the cells lining the blood vessel. And as a result, what happens is all the coagulation cascade gets completely out of whack, the inflammatory response goes uh, absolutely insane and you get edema because you get basically fluid leaking into various organs. So once this has emerged, it can spread back to the original source of this virus. So it can spread back to wild birds. But in wild birds, it's a very, very different story. And this will be nuanced a little bit about what species of wild bird we're talking about, but here let's just focus on ducks um, and focus particularly on mallard ducks because that's just um, sort of go-to duck if you want to say that. So what happens in ducks is when they're infected with this highly pathogenic avian influenza, it's not nearly as severe as what we see in chickens. So often they get low virus replication. They don't have any problems with edema or hemorrhaging. They may develop neurological signs, but that's really in more extreme cases. And what we know is that the virus is not infecting the endothelium of these birds. So that's one of the major reasons why they're not getting that hemorrhaging, they're not getting that edema. So from our perspective as researchers, this is absolutely a, a perfect scenario to use comparative genomics to understand what's going on. Specifically, what we can do is we can compare, say, the genome of the duck to the chicken and say, well, what is it about ducks? What do they have that confer resistance to avian influenza? And why is it missing in chickens? And then the long-term goal is it, of this is can you then breed that back into chickens either by selective breeding or genetic modification? So it all sounds well and good in theory. Um, the reality is that unfortunately, ducks and chickens are very, very far apart on the evolutionary scale. So they diverged about 90 million years ago. As a result, their genomes have a large number of differences but it's almost too many to nail it down to one factor. So we know that they have a very different immune response. We know that a lot of their biology is very different. So it becomes very, very hard to say, okay, let's identify the factor that confers either resistance or susceptibility to avian influenza. So this is where swans come into their own. So swans are, um, it sounds quite random, but I will explain this. Um, swans basically have, uh, quite a different response to high pack avian influenza. And that depends on whether you're a black swan, so the Australian black swan, or if you're a white swan, uh, more typical of Europe and North America. So white swans, and in this case, mute swans, if they're infected with that high pack flu, they have late clinical signs. So they, they do develop clinical signs, but it's about seven days post-infection. They mainly get sort of mild to moderate listlessness and they develop a few neurological signs. So they will do sort of a head tilt um, as a sign of neurological disease. And importantly, the virus never infects the endothelium. So again, you don't have those problems with hemorrhaging and edema. Swap over to the Australian black swan. And here you have a highly susceptible swan species. They have about 100% mortality within two to three days of infection. And once again, you get the hemorrhaging, you get the edema, and the virus is infecting the endothelium. So from a comparative biology perspective, this is ideal because you have two species that only diverged seven million years ago, one that's highly susceptible and one that's much more resistant. And we can use that to try and figure out what confers susceptibility and resistance on a genetic level. And just to show you that this is not restricted to a uh, experimental setting, you also see this same discrepancy in swan populations in the wild. So this was a story from Israel where they had high path uh, avian flu emerge in their zoo. And what they saw is that all their black swans died, but all their mute swans were completely fine. So it's again that black swans are hyper susceptible to high path avian flu. So in order to answer this from a comparative genomics perspective, we need to have genomes. And when we started this work, there was no swan genomes available, let alone the Australian black swan. So that was one of the first things we started to do. So we did the black swan genome, and we did this by using PacBio, um, and we also did high seed for the assembly. And then because we're not just interested in what's in the genome, we're also interested in what's being expressed, 
we also did transcriptional analysis, and I'll come back to that. For the MUTES one, um, we had a bit of a fortuitous story uh, insofar as our collaborators from Germany as part of the vertebrate genome project had already started sequencing the MUTES one. Um, they weren't going to do anything with it. So we teamed up with them and said, well, now we're interested in the MUTES one. Um, can we share our data? So that's been a really fantastic collaboration. So it's through them that we have the genome of the MUTES one and that's all been annotated now. So just to show you a little bit about the quality of these genomes, so on the left here, you can see the BASCO analysis. And this is telling you just the percentage coverage of the genome that you're getting. So what sort of quality genome do we have? Um, and really, if you see a red bit here, you don't want red bits because that means it's not covered. It's not good coverage. So you can see on the top, the black swan is actually on par with the chicken, which is very well annotated and well described genome. The mid swan, the quality is a bit lower and it's probably on par, if not better, than than the dark. So these are still good quality genomes, but definitely the black swan is kind of our um, top quality. You can see the same thing here when you look at genome completeness assembly, um, assessment, sorry. So this is looking at if you take 248 ultra conserved genes, how many of them are you detecting in your genome? And that tells you how good your genome is. So for the mutant black swan, you're detecting 221 and 218, so that's really good. And the duck, you're only detecting 198. So, and this is the chicken here, 226. So that's telling us that our genomes are, again, probably more on par with that high quality chicken genome. Now we're still doing the annotation of the black swan genome. Um, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail there, but just suffice to say, we are looking at the genetic differences. But for the rest of the talk, I wanna to talk to you about the transcriptional differences we see in these species. So to study the transcriptional response, we really wanted to pick the cell type that was most relevant physiologically to infection. And as I mentioned to you, in the black swan and the chicken, that's the endothelial cell. So what we did, um, as crazy as it sounds, is we set up a method to isolate endothelial cells from chickens, ducks, and black swans. And yes, this did involve going on a trip to New Zealand to collect black swans that were being culled as part of the program, take the bone marrow, go down to Dunedin, isolate cells and ship them back to Australia. Um, so it's been quite the process. So what we do for this is we isolate the bone marrow stem cells from these birds. We then stain them with a marker for endothelial cells and we sort them by flow cytometry and then we grow them in culture. So we can do that from swans, chickens and ducks. Just to show you that we do indeed have endothelial cells, this is a really simple assay for detecting whether your cell is endothelial or not. So endothelial cells, if you put them under a certain condition, they'll start forming these almost dendrites um, and forming these tubes, essentially, because that's what they like to do. So what you can see here, and that's sort of what the idealized tube looks like, what you can see here is that we're forming that in the chickens, and the black swans, but in our negative control, we don't see that. So these are indeed endothelial cells. So then what we did is we infected these endothelial cells with highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, and we looked at the transcriptional response six hours post-infection. And what we saw was some pretty interesting findings. So just as you would expect, in the chickens after infection, you've got a whole lot of cytokines being upregulated. And that makes sense because there's a viral infection, so you'd want the immune response to be doing something. You see the same thing in black swans, a whole lot of different cytokines being expressed. But when you look in ducks, there was basically no differential cytokine expression. It was this very muted immunoregulatory response. So we started wondering, well, why would that be? And is that why we're getting so much more severe disease in the chickens and black swans? Because their immune response is going out of control, essentially. So that brings me to our first finding of the transcriptional data. And that's that this dysregulation of a gene family called duspies may contribute to the immunopathology in chickens and black swans. So let me explain that a little bit more. When we looked at the pathways that were most differentially expressed in the ducks, what we saw was that one of the, the pathways that was really, really strongly differentially expressed was the inactivation of the MAP-K pathway. So MAP-K is a pro-inflammatory pathway and it's involved in many different aspects, but in the immune response, it's pro-inflammatory. 
and it's regulated by a set of genes called DUSPIs. So DUSPIs down regulate from that CAG pathway. Accordingly, when we look at this by CAG pathway analysis, you can see that these DUSPIs in the duct are being upregulated, and that's stopping the inflammation. In contrast, in the chicken, these DUSPIs are downregulated, and in the swan, these DUSPIs are downregulated. So this is just showing you the different DUSPI genes and the fact that they're all upregulated in the duct, but they're either downregulated or not differentially expressed in the uh, black swan of the chicken. So we think that this is driving some of the immunopathology we see both in vitro and in vivo. The next thing we noticed was an impairment in the black swan's ability to sense viral infections. And this sensing occurs through a pattern recognition receptor called TLR7. Basically what TLR7 does is it recognizes single-stranded viral RNA. And so that then triggers the immune response to say, hey, there's an invading pathogen, we need to do something about that. Now, we have constituted the expression of TLR7 in chickens and ducks, and probably more so in ducks than chickens, and that sort of makes sense because the ducks are responding and detecting the virus much better than chickens. But what we see in black swans is we fail to find any expression of TLR7. So this is both in our transcriptomic data, this is in isoseq data across various tissues, and we can find it in the genome. So the gene's there, but we think probably what's happened is it's become a pseudogene. And so as a result, probably the swans aren't detecting the virus very well. And we're currently doing the same analysis in mute swans to see if this is restricted, if this is essentially a swan thing or a black swan thing. But just to give you a bit more evidence on this, when you look at the signaling pathway for TLR7, the downstream signaling molecules in YD88. So in ducks, makes sense, they have TLR7 turned on and after viral infection, NYD88 goes up because they're sensing the virus. In chickens, you see the same thing, but in black swans, NYD88 actually goes down. So that's again fitting with the suggestion that the sort of upstream signaling molecule is either absent or not being expressed properly. And then the final um, point that I just want to touch on is some of the findings that we've made with AMP32A. So AMP32A is a host factor that facilitates viral replication. And there's different isoforms. So you have an isoform that has 33 amino acids um, missing in it. So it's just been skipped. You have an isoform with 33 amino acids and an isoform with 29 amino acids. Now, the 29 and 33 amino acid isoforms are essential for the replication of avian flu. That's what birds need for the virus to replicate. But importantly, the 33 amino acids are just infinitely more um, efficient for viral replication. And in fact, what we see is that in the black swans, uh, more so than in the chickens and ducks, we actually have more of that highly potent AMP32A that has the 33 amino acids. So that would suggest better virus replication. So just to sum up, that's a lot of data and a lot of works in, in one piece. The reason why we think black swans are so susceptible is probably multifactorial here. It's probably to do with dust bee dysregulation, lack of proper viral sensing, and probably high levels of AMP32A. So unfortunately, there's a lot of things working against the black swan, um, that means it's highly susceptible to avian flu. So finally, I just want to thank everyone who's been associated with this work. It's been epic, uh, to say the least. And I have to acknowledge here Anjana, who's the PhD student who's been driving this and just done such a fantastic job with all the analysis and bioinformatics, because that's certainly not my area of expertise. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher, for the very exciting presentation. Uh, does anyone has a question? Question for Christy? Rob? Uh. Very interesting, Kirsty. Thank you. So, are we more like a black swan or a duck? Um, well, it becomes a bit more complicated. We're probably more like a black swan than a duck. Um, so when we talk oh, about yeah. yeah, when we talk about highly pathogenic avian influenza, so this particular strain that we use for these experiments, it has about a 60% mortality rate in humans. 
Um, so this is a strain of flu that it can get it and have no matter what, and actually it's worse if you're younger, um, you have a 60% chance that you can die. So from that perspective, I would be risking more life chickens for a black swans, unfortunately. So just to follow up um, on that, Chris, so does this suggest any potential genetic engineering, synthetic biology strategies that we might employ either in ducks or in therapists or in humans that might protect us from uh, making flu in the future? Yeah, so this is something that we're actively looking at, and we've actually got a grant from Australian Eggs for all random sources of, of research funding um, that is actually supporting us looking into this. So we're looking at using crispr cas um, to genetically manipulate these cells in vitro and knock in and knock out various duck and chicken factors and see if we can make chicken cells a bit more resistant and duck cells a bit more susceptible. Um, with the idea that then potentially you could move that into transgenic chickens. And there's a lot of interest in the industry for developing chickens that are resistant to avian flu because avian flu just decimates poultry every year. Great, thank you. I did not know that there's birds in this. Blame the birds. Always blame the birds. Always blame the birds. Just wondering, like, black swans are not, what's the still rate of black swans? Is there a good reason why black swans are bad for us? Yeah, so, um, black swans are native to Australia. They were introduced into New Zealand, um, and they're actually now pest in New Zealand. Um, so it's kind of a similar story to the possum story. Um, one of the reasons we think that probably black swans are so susceptible is because they have evolved in this isolated environment, much the same as what we see with a lot of Australian marsupials in that they have a restricted immune repertoire um, that's resulted in things like the uh, facial tumor disease of the Tasmanian devils. So probably it's their restricted geographic isolation that's led to a lack of selective pressure for conferences to avian flu. Because a lot of um, the avian flu, Australia and New Zealand are incredibly lucky that the birds, it typically emerges in, in uh, Asia, and then the birds travel westward rather than down south. So that's why we don't really get much avian flu, because we're just not on that migratory path of the birds. So I think the isolation is totally wrong. Any other questions? Uh, we have one question from the uh, audience in the chat box. Um, has the symbio element of this research begun yet? Yeah, so the question was, has, this, has the symbio aspect of this research begun yet? So we've really started that this year, um, or a little bit last year, and we're doing two projects. So one was what I just mentioned before, doing in vitro crispr cas and really trying to get the genetic factors knocked out, knocked in and work it out. The other is we already have a candidate gene, um, an aspect of the immune response that's missing um, in chickens and it's present in ducks. It's sort of there in ducks ones, but not very well. Um, so in collaboration with the Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness, we're actually breeding chickens now um, that are expressing this gene. And then eventually, once they're bred up, and this is a long process, we're going to be challenging them with avian flu. So things are in the works. It's just a slow process, um, and it's taken us a long time just to get to this stage. So um, I think the best is yet to come. Thank you. Any further questions from the audience here? Any questions from people in the Zoom thing? Let's know. Uh, thanks a lot, Christy. Well, our next speaker is Dr. Frank Sensbury. Uh, Dr. Frank Sensbury is affiliated to the Center of Cell Factories and Biopolymers at the Griffith Institute for Drug Discovery. And um, he's going to present us his research. So thanks so much. Right, thank you. The people on Zoom, are they looking at me? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll stand a bit to the side if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. No, no, that's cool. Um, all right. So thanks for having me. Um, I think it's great that you do this actually. And I wish I had been to previous events. Um, I think it's also great that it's driven by ECR students, postdocs, um, rather than old farts, although, of course, some of them rock up every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's a, great, um, it's a great thing you're doing here. So thank you again. All right, so I'm going to talk about some of what we do with virus structural proteins. Um, structural proteins of capsid based viruses, so nothing enveloped or, or scary like flu or coronaviruses. And a little bit about why we do it. Um, and then a, a really recent example of something that we're doing um, to use um, the engineering of, of coat proteins of viruses to sort of unravel biological questions. Um, it's something that we started in 2021, so super fresh. Uh, okay, so virus like nanoparticles, they're, you know, VLPs, but they're nanoparticles, so we treat them as nanoparticles for some, um, you know, funding applications, or we treat them like viruses for others. There are nice containers, right, so they are used, the virus uses them to transport sensitive cargo into um, cells to deliver sensitive cargo to very specific locations. And they are very, they have very high structural fidelity, right? So um, they assemble often through a self-assembly process that doesn't require any other factors. So you can get virus coproteins that just come together into these perfectly ordered icosahedra. And it means that we can look at how to program them with other functions. Okay, so we can determine the structure of them. And we can look at how to program the functions. Somebody said, you look good, Frank. I don't know who said that. Okay, I'm now definitely hiding. Okay, so uh, what's useful for us is that we lots of different ones you can make, right? And we can make them in lots of different hosts. So here's a few that I've worked with. Um, polyomaviruses, cowpea mosaic virus, um, bluton core-like particles, and P22, a bacteriophage um, DLPs that I'm going to talk a bit more about in detail. And there are lots of different ways to load the cargo. So protein encapsulation is our thing. We like to get different proteins inside for lots of different reasons. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do that. So you can assemble the capsid in an environment that has a high concentration of your cargo and get it to encapsulate just randomly. That's statistical sort of encapsulation. And you can drive that, you can sort of push that a bit better with, by engineering um, complementary charges between your cargo and your, and your coat. Um, but the more effective ways are sort of self-sorting mechanisms that draw on um, the ways in which viruses encapsulate their own cargo, so I'll be that non-structural proteins or um, nucleic acid. And so you, we can take um, the mechanism from them and sort of engineer that onto our own cargo. So you can use peptide um, binders that will link to, that will bind to the inter internal surface of your capsid, or even short nucleic acid strands that um, carry encapsidation signals. Um, and the third method is by direct uh, covalent linkages. So programmed um, and statistical methods are sort of non-covalent, but you can do it covalently if the if the coat protein is permissive to that, you can fuse proteins directly to it, or you can use fancy strategies um, that result in covalent linkages like um, spy tag, spy catch, spy tag systems, or even uh, sautés ligations. And so, what's you know a bit boggling sometimes, very hard to choose platform is that you can have assembly in vivo, or you can have assembly in vitro, and it depends a lot on the virus. So why? why? Why do we want to stick proteins inside of capsids? Well, we, I embarked on this, you know, initially with the idea of making tools for bioengineering so we could deliver active 
biomolecules, proteins, or otherwise into cells, because obviously viruses have great ways of getting into cells. That's what they do for a living. Um, and they have a way of delivering their sensitive cargoes to you know, locations within the cell that actually um, are useful. And so we started using this polyomavirus coprotein that is actually produced um, as a coprotein, not assembled in E. coli. Um, and we can induce assembly in vitro. And so by co-expressing a cargo and a, and a, and a short sequence from, from a minor coprotein, we could get the coat and the cargo to associate in vivo, purify the complex, and then assemble that in vitro. And using this platform, we get very efficient uptake into cells. And the cargo in this case is a red fluorescent protein. Um, and you need assembly of VLP to get that efficient uptake. So you need multivalent interactions between your delivery vehicle and the cell re and the cells receptors um, to get efficient uptake. So capsomeres are just the um, the coat protein pentamers that become VLPs but have not yet. So also we might want to create in vivo compartments. And this is work that you can read on BioArchive and soon to be somewhere else um, by Lee Chen Chia up in the audience, in collaboration with Claudia Vickers. Um, and in this case, we want to create a discrete environment inside a cell um, to do metabolism, to enhance metabolism. Um, in this example, we achieved that by using an enzyme that's normally not very stable. Okay, so having it inside the compartment stabilizes it. And um, we see a modest increase in the product, in the production of this glucaric acid, um, small, this small molecule glucaric acid, which is actually quite useful for downstream applications. But interestingly, we get that from a lot less, and here's two time points that you can see, of the protein um, versus the non-encapsulated form. So the big blobs there are the non-encapsulated form. So, you know, it's, it's a start, and I think Li Chen's really hit on something there to probe a bit further, but we can stabilize this enzyme to produce more of a useful metabolite. Okay, here's another reason, nano lasers. This is what we would like to make. This is actually the structure of the gluton virus core particle encapsulating GFP. And so we don't resolve the GFP very well because it's on flexible linkers, but we can see it's there and it's where we expect it. Um, my collaborator, uh, Bogdan Dragnia in Indiana University has shown this really fascinating phenomenon where by conjugating small molecule dyes to a small plant virus, this is broom mosaic virus, what you see is actually the fluorophores talking to each other. And so they undergo what's called coherent relaxivity. You excite them and they all relax and emit their light together. And they only do that if you increase the amount of the fluorophore, so going through these colors here is increased fluorophore per particle. So they only do that when they're arranged in a geometric array and having that precise structure of the viral capsid provides that array. So what happens is as you increase the number of fluorophores, you sort of go down this axis, which is the fluorescence lifetime. What's happening is you're getting quenching of the signal, but at some point when you have enough fluorophores all nicely arranged in this array, the quenching doesn't matter. You still have a very short lifetime. All the molecules talk to each other, but they emit way more photons. So it's a really cool phenomenon that actually enhances the amount of light that can come from the fluorophores. And we'd like to achieve that with biological fluorophores. Um, and one reason for that is that we like to understand how processes like light harvesting complexes and photosynthesis work. And that's all pretty far out and it's pretty far away. And the main reason why 
I put it up here today is because I wanted to show this gif. Because essentially that's what we're doing. I don't think it's pretty cool. Um, but there is another point, and it's that you don't get this effect until you have a very high concentration, localized high concentration of the fluorophores. And it brings me to this point that in vitro biochemistry is very, very, very different to in vivo biochemistry. The other day, there was a tweet. So this is the tweet, it's this image. And you, know, um, you may have seen these beautiful images of the cell um, done by David Goodsell. And somebody was sort of contrasting that to um, you know, how we normally draw our diagrams of our little processes. And I have to say there was a lot of consternation on Twitter from mostly, in fact, entirely male scientists who said, oh yeah, but we're just representing, you know, simplifying things so that, it, so that we can see what's going on. You know, we don't really think that. But, you know, really, are they thinking about macular and molecular crowding or viscosity when they consider their little reactions, their little pet reactions? Not really, probably. In the cell, protein concentration is 200 to 300 mg per mil. So that's not really achievable in a test tube. I know of some proteins that you can get to 30, 40 mg per mil, but most things are crashing out before then. And so a lot of different things happen at these sorts of concentrations. And we are trying to explore ways of reaching these concentrations using these small compartments. So the bacteria, P22 bacteriophage VLPs um, were developed by a friend and colleague, Trevor Douglas uh, in, in Indiana now. And it's a you know, bacteriophage and you can express the procapsids like this, that the capsidate, they actually use the scaffold protein to, to um, mediate assembly of the coprotein and you can use fusions to that scaffold protein um, to create this non-covalent self-sorting type encapsidation. And inside, you have your cargo proteins at molar concentration. So depending on the size of the protein, it's 100 to 300 mg per mil. And so it approaches the sorts of concentrations that you see in the cell. Now, I think the picture I showed before is a little bit, well, it's not misleading, but it's not like proteins are all bumping into each other the whole time. So 200 to 300 mg per mil is 20 to 30% uh, weight to volume. Okay, so there's a little bit of space and it's what we approach inside these capsules. So in this system, oh, 50 plus, I mean, that's a bit old. A lot of enzymes have been encapsulated using this system and Trevor's working out some very interesting things about the way enzymes work by doing this. And um, what I'm about to talk to you about is funded by the Human Frontals of Science project that was awarded to Claudia here, along with Pedro de Pablo, who's the lead CI in Madrid, and he's actually a physicist, and this is Trevor Douglas, who's developed the P22 system. And it's about looking at the behavior of enzymes in crowded environments. And at our end, this is all done by Ligi Esperol, who's up here in the audience. So everything I'm going to talk about now is done by her, not me. So um, we developed a, a new cloning system. So Trevor's a chemist, okay? So he doesn't really know about cloning. Um, and then we're sort of just doing one at a time type, cut things out, and paste things in. Um, so we sort of adapted that to a bit more throughput and made our own sort of Golden Gate class type system. So our, donor, our, our acceptor vectors actually contain CCDB lethal gene that you probably recognize from gateway cloning, which just adds a bit of um, <clears throat> simplicity to, to analyzing clones. All right, so we did this with a lot of different orientations of the scaffold protein. So we express the coprotein in the system, but also the scaffold protein that mediates its assembly. And that's that becomes fused to our gene. And we also have a his tag at the end. 
And so we've done this in various orientations, N-terminal, C-terminal, scaffold, two different lengths of scaffold, and just some control constructs so we can isolate enzymes or whatever it is independently of the system and put that into a, a PBAD based backbone. What we do usually is co-express that with a different vector, with a different promoter so that we can sort of um, modulate the timing of the different components of the system. And so by there are also two of these that we have in, in a dual expression vector just for simplicity. But what it gives us is that all of these features about orientation, um, signal peptide length, uh, sorry, scaffold, peptide, scaffold protein length um, and timing of expression. So you can you know, start expressing your cargo to accumulate a lot before you provide um, the, the, the capsid. Um, this is, um, yeah, these all affect loading levels. And I'm not going to go into detail about that. That'll be for leisure to do one day. But I'm going to tell you about something quite um, interesting, well, something very interesting that we've been doing with it um, that doesn't involve enzymes. But it does involve a, a bio based material. We are looking at. Um, from a fortuitous conversation with somebody in the School of Environment and Science at Griffith University. We're looking at the deposition of calcium carbonate that forms shells or mother of pearl type shells or make and, and pearls, essentially. They are a mix of calcium carbonate and proteins and other biopolymers. What controls the way in which the calcium carbonate is deposited and the type of calcium carbonate that it makes are these proteins, which is super fascinating. So there's a layer of, I've got that yet, a layer of mantle proteins, which secrete um, all of these matrix, mantle matrix proteins, and that actually recruits calcium carbonate and arranges it into the most amazing structures. So it, it makes these plate-like uh, depositions of calcium carbonate and the thickness of these and the, and the proteins in between them actually define how lustrous they'll be, how shiny they are and how uh, strong they are and how hard they are. And um, it's also been shown so that nanoscale or little nano-sized crystals of different types of calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate polymorphs are different minerals of calcium carbonate. They actually have been already shown to enhance osteoblast proliferation and differentiation. We work in a drug discovery institute, so it's got to be some kind of medical use for these in the end. But really, we want to know how all these different proteins, well, Carmel wants to know how all these different proteins come together to create this amazing structure that we all sort of know from this macroscopic perspective. And so we went to encapsulate some of these matrix proteins because it has been, you know, a, a few groups have attempted to recreate these structures in vitro, but the limiting factor is always the concentration of these small proteins. Um, Liji put four of them into two of the different donor uh, acceptor vectors, different orientations to work out just quickly how we could get um, the most encapsulated. And they are very, they're relatively small proteins, um, quite disordered, which makes them sometimes hard to work with. Uh, we remove the signal peptides, obviously, because they are secreted, but we don't need that. And we chose a range of different types of mantle proteins. So this is what it looks a little bit like after purification. Just look at these, these lanes. That's the coat protein and these are the cargos. And so for these three examples, and I'll talk a little about PFMG, no, PFMG one later, um, we get good levels of encapsulation. And we didn't just choose them randomly. This is Carmel McDougall, whose who's main focus is comparative tr uh, transcriptomics in shellfish and she's particularly interested in how they form, how they build their shells um, in response to the environment and changes in the environment. 
Okay, so I'm going to go through two examples quickly of um, different mantle proteins that we've got inside the particles. AP7 is from abalone, um, and it's known to inhibit calcite. Now, that crazy structure that I showed you that makes up mink or mother of pearl is um, mostly aragonite. So calcite and aragonite are two different polymorphs or different mineral types of calcium carbonate. And um, calcite is actually really easy to form. You can precipitate it with your eyes closed in the, in the test tube or a bottle or whatever, or a bucket. Um, but aragonite is, is not. And so this protein is known to inhibit calcite formation, pushing things towards aragonite. But it requires high concentrations to do so. So it's not even clear if that's what its sole role is because it's impossible to get things at this concentration outside of a nice little container. What we saw when we first tried to purify it was that the, so we, we purify our, our particles on a density gradient. So that's what this is after an ultra centrifugation run through a density gradient made up of iodixanol. Um, they were, you know, they were brown. We'd never seen that before. It's a different, slightly different gradient on the right with this control tube, but normally the VLP layer that we look for is white. And so seeing them brown like that was like, whoa, something's happening here. And um, we went to do TEM on them and looked at them staining. It's not the best staining in this example, but you can see obviously with the staining, you can see all the virus like particles. When you look at it unstained, you can't see particles anymore because carbon doesn't, it's not electron dense enough for you to see that. Calcium is on the other hand. And so we suspect that there is actually calcium, calcium carbonate inside some of the particles, probably not all of the particles. If we look at them a bit closer, they're a sort of appropriate size for something to have uh, accumulated or precipitated inside the particles. PFMG1, which should have a species there. This is actually from Pearl Oyster. It's a pretty well studied um, example. And so this, this affects the nucleation and growth of the crystals. Um, it's also, it, it's associated with um, accumulation of calcium carbonate. And it's not really clear which, which polymorph it sort of directs. I didn't really emphasize it before, but there's 50 of these mantle proteins. So they all work in concert somehow. And so we are eventually we hope to be able to combine them. But it's, also, it's really been shown that this protein alone can promote osteoblast differentiation. So aid in bone healing. Okay, so the reason why I didn't show it before was that we find particles, but we don't see the protein. So it's impossible for the scaffold fusion protein to not be there because it's required to mediate assembly of the, of the coat protein. So when we purify them, they both have to be there. Don't know why it's not on this gel, um, but you know, these things happen. When we looked at the particles, we see VLPs as expected. And although it does look like there are some sort of accumulation of um, of something more electron dense, you'll have to take my word for it when I say that it wasn't, they're not as black as what we saw for AP7. They're a bit more dull and they're a lot less of the, um, a lot less of a lower number of these, of these spots. However, if you feed it some calcium and you don't have to provide carbonate, because actually it can take atmospheric carbon. Calcium, carbon, ca uh, calcium carbonate formation is actually sort of a prehistoric driver of global temperatures due to blooming and, and waning of, of um, diatoms, which are made of the same material. And they absorb atmospheric carbon and they control the um, pH of oceans. After seven days with a bit more calcium, we actually saw a lot more of these precipitates and they looked super interesting. So they have these little spikes 
And so when you nucleate the growth of the crystal, it will then start growing out in different directions. And the capsid of, of P22 is porous. So unfortunately, we can't resolve the capsids on the same images, and that's a, a contrast issue, but we're working on that. So when you have these electron dense structures, it's really hard to see other things. But it, gave, it sort of opened up a yeah, temporal sort of can of worms. So we might be pulling in calcium carbonate and then it is changing. And it's, it's actually, no, it's been associated with PFMG1 that it will mediate a transition to different polymorphs. And so we're working at looking at trying to work out how to find out what kind of calcium carbonate you have inside. And um, after a couple of months of finding the right person and the right equipment, we finally got to some, some results. Um, and this is the AP7 construct that looked really good before. Um, and using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, which is basically just a fancy detector attached to a TEM, we can see that there's calcium unexpected, well, you know, what, it, there's calcium there. It wouldn't be expected if it was just protein, obviously. And so there was really positive sign. But what was also kind of striking and unexpected was that the morphology um, of the AP7 deposits, they completely changed, um, completely changed. And it's a bit surprising. Aragonite actually looks like this. So I'm not gonna say that it is this, I'm just, just saying it. We could have it. So um, what, what we do is we like to engineer BLPs as discrete compartments for regulating biochemical processes, both in vivo and in vitro. We also like to discover more VLPs. And this is one that belongs to the virus of a, of a plant virus, a really fascinating family of plant viruses that um, potentially confer a beneficial, um, beneficial effect on their hosts. We also like to develop better ways to express and purify VLPs. So yes, we use E. coli to make bacteriophage VLPs. We sometimes also use yeast to make VLPs. And we sometimes also use plants to make VLPs. Like this one was made in plants, as was the BTV core-like particle. And we also make the components of VLPs and assemble them in vitro. And some other work that we're doing is to look at how we can template their assembly into different structures to again answer different ask different questions about the way in which viruses and their hosts interact and i'll leave you with this very fancy teaser prepared by don and Peel, my student up there because to 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 illustrate how we're templating their assembly and that's it Thanks a lot, Frank. Uh, so let's move on to the questions. Does anyone in the public the audience has a question? Oh, sorry. No. Uh, yeah, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, so I just had a question about uh, you have these uh, biomineralization peptides and other enzymes that's really cap encapsulating this environment. Um, does that sometimes create a barrier to them attaining their substrates? Yeah, okay, good question. So it very much depends on the capsid as to what level of um, of what kind of barrier they might pose to diffusion. It's when individual um, compounds like this, there's no barrier in most cases. And usually the, the barrier is in the order of nanometers. So there is some impact and it's sort of a case by case basis when it comes to doing the total the total of engineering and having small molecules get in and out. There's actually a lot going on, a lot more going on than just the size of the core as well. Um, the interactions with the co-protein that are not well understood. But it's yeah, definitely something to consider. Any other questions from the 
audience here have a <laughs> it's maybe a bit naive or maybe it's difficult to stand so, but um, I think you said something about how you can get much higher levels of soluble protein inside of our like particle, but you could if you try to achieve that same concentration um, just in solution. Um, I was presuming that the um, um, the aqueous environment would be the same inside the virus like particle to, to outside, but so, so what I'm asking, I guess, what was the driver of uh, the disorder? Don't ask me why. Of all the questions, don't ask me why. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> oh, really? That, that, I don't know. Yep. Absolutely no idea. It may be that actually they're not fully soluble inside. It's, it's just a question. And um, you're welcome. <laughs> that might explain some things to do with the enzymes that we've seen. Um, yeah, but um, yeah. so I think it would be good. Like you also made a good point about this inside the cell, you get very high concentrations of, of protein, but they're different proteins. So, it's, um, and so would it be would it be different um, inside a virus like particle? Would you get higher solubility? Do you think it would be you had uh, a number of proteins versus one of them. So. I, I would expect so. I mean, because. <sighs> so, yeah, the actual sort of molecular details around that, talking about the different salts that are in your buffer, hydration cells, and all kinds of salts, and how they impact hydration cells. So, I don't know anything about this. I suspect that it's cool. Any other questions from the audience? We have a few questions from the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a question from Karen Weber. She mentioned, have you looked to copolite falls for the calcium carbonate leaves? Uh, white leaves of Dover are made of their leads from millions of years ago and single cell Organisms so simpler than selfish. Mm. Shellfish. Yeah, that, that's well. That's um, yeah, good point because you know marine snow is calcium carbonate and it's made by these single cell organisms. And the answer to the question of have we looked into it is no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't actually know anything about how they do that. Oh, diatoms are silica. There you go. Oh, it's phytoplankton. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. I'll write down that name. I'm glad you appreciated the Star Wars reference. <laughs> Sorry, Karen's into it. <laughs> I, I wish you were here. I was thought you might be here. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay. I have to stay next to the plant. Any other questions? No. Are you able to modulate the, the environment inside at all? Like change the pH or any other tricks like that? No. There's been some funky ideas uh, thrown around about how to do that in terms of, other, in terms of um, different molecular species, oxygen, for example. But it's not, because the, of the porosity, it's not really possible to stop is going in now, except you could sort of have some kind of enzymatic driver for the raging from the inside. Things like yeah, oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. No questions? Uh, no more questions? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, do you want to read the question? Yeah, yeah, I've got that. I'll read it out. Peter Waterhouse, g'day. What is the size range number of the peptides that you can put in the VLPs? Yeah, also a good question. So the P22 system is really flexible and um, you can have multimeric proteins in there if you let them mature and assemble before you express the coat. Um, the actual number of those will obviously go down. It's variable for P22. 
If we're using BTV, we do a direct fission to the coat protein and there are 120 of those. So where we have those GFPs inside, there's 120. Um, not to say that they're all fluorescent. Um, and with polyomavirus particles, we can get up to 72. And they, there seems to be a size limit on that um, or for monomeric proteins of maybe around 50 to 60 kilodaltons. Um, we can also do oligomeric proteins inside P22. So obviously that gets a bit bigger. And the limit on P22, yeah, would be over 100 kilodaltons, I'm sure, for an enzyme inside P22 with many copies. Yeah. So I think if there's no further questions, I want also to thank again, Frank, thanks a lot. Um, so we have a few more slides before we move to the social part. And okay, right here. So I want to remind you also if you haven't followed us in social media, so here's where we keep updating you guys regarding different events we organize. This is every uh, two months, we also try to follow up uh, SBA social uh, catch up every first Friday of each month that usually we have at the German club. We're trying to change to different venues. We really want you all guys to come hang out, meet other people, other students, other PIs, so we can know what's happening in the Symbio um, area in Brisbane. So we have an uh, email if you want to contact us or any one of the speakers. Uh, we have Twitter, we have the Slack channel, and also we have a YouTube channel. So make sure you look for us in those uh, social media. Also, we want now to uh, acknowledge the support that we receive from the sponsors. One of them is New England's Biolab. As you can see, they are part of, uh, they are sponsoring also the 2021 Symbio Challenge. It was a very successful uh, competition last year. It's starting again today. So, Please, uh, also, they asked us to request those free NEB Australia products. So also, remember last session, you can access your first year PhD student. You can also access this uh, first uh, key, like the uh, starter kit for molecular biology. They're pretty cool. One of the students already in the lab got them. So, and if you have any more information about any of those products, you can contact Jenny uh, Brown at her email, uh, email like jbrown at neb.com. Also, we want to acknowledge the uh, sponsorship from the Code Science, and for that we have Peter here that he wants to give us a few uh, chat about this part. Peter, are you here? Can I? I will unmute you, please. Sure. Can you hear me, Juan? And this is going to be challenging. For me. Yeah. No. Can you Can you hear me at all, Juan? Give me it's okay. You can because we cannot hear you. That's cool. You can just flick through the slides. <laughs> can you hear me, all one? So, okay, Peter, could you speak? <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, one. Can you hear me? <laughs> hey. But Can you hear me, Juan? It was it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> you can just go to the next. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm unmuted, but um, can you hear me at all, Juan? No. We can hear you on Zoom, but they obviously can't hear you. Ah, uh, yeah, no worries. Just flick through the slides. Just go to the last one. Yeah. No. So Just it's uh, should we fix that? No, I don't think it's done. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, <laughs> Just go to the last slide, one. Can you hear me? Something maybe with the iPad that we need to fix. Thanks for trying. <laughs> Okay, sorry for all these uh, technical difficulties. We're going to move to this slide, so... Yes. 
is on here. Yeah. So uh, we apologize for all these technical issues. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, uh, Peter. So I think uh, one of the main things that uh, Peter wanted to tell us uh, is to say the date, 11th of June, uh, between 2030 and 4.30 p.m. There also will be drinks. So is it Twist Discovery Day? It's a lot of speakers to be uh, announced soon. It's going to happen at CSI Road, Dutton Park, in the seminar room. So probably we will be advertising through the different social uh, media, all the details for this event. And well, just put that day down in your like, uh, calendars. Uh, and also uh, the God Science, they sponsor us. And they are very generous sponsors because they provide $500 voucher for gene synthesis. And for that one, already help us to decide who the winners are. And for that, underneath the cushions, there's some um, vouchers. So those vouchers could include either these $500 gene synthesis uh, voucher, or also you could win like a twist uh, uh, gift pack that has some materials and materials and stuff. Um, anything else that you would like me to add, Peter, before I announce who are the winners? Oh, the twist prize bag is a t-shirt, a water bottle, and socks. Perfect. So, could the person who won the twist prize bag could raise their hand. Okay, so the winner is Sack. So, Sack will receive the gift bag sometime soon. And the winner for the gene synthesis $500 voucher is. Oh. Sweet. So, what's your name? No, not. Okay, so apparently nobody's in the spot of the voucher. So, guys, go and find it. Okay, someone found it. Perfect. Awesome. So, uh, uh, Laura would be in contact, uh, or Juan would be in contact with you guys so we can, uh, like, you can receive your gifts. So, thanks a lot. So, just keep those vouchers so you can receive the gift from Twitch by Science. Thanks again uh, to our sponsors. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so congratulations to the winners. And um, again, thanks, Juan, for. Uh, hiding the uh, vouchers and um, just finally so we can now move on towards this uh, social media and now Still. we also have the sponsorship on the food from the UQ node of the ALC Center for Synthetic Biology so please join us have some wraps and also we have cookies and some drinks thanks so much and also everyone who joined us through the Zoom link Thanks uh, again for joining us and please stay in touch when we announce the next meeting. See you.